All right, brothers and sisters, if I could have your attention, we'll go ahead and jump right in. This is the breakout where we uh, address the topic of establishing appropriate rhythms between work and rest. So if this is not the breakout you were hoping for, then you can, uh, you can slip out and find the one that you are looking for. If, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I won't be offended at all. There's lots of good ones to, to choose from. I'm going to try to persuade us in this talk of something that is pretty basic, uh, but very uh, basic to understand, but actually quite hard to do, which is work hard, rest well. <laughs> work really hard and rest really well. That's the aim of, of what I'm going to try to strike at in this talk. There's several good books that have been published recently, somewhat recently on the topic, one not so recently. But uh, uh, several, several helpful resources that I would recommend to you. Kevin DeYoung's book, Crazy Busy, uh, the subtitle captures it well. A mercifully short book on a really big problem. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's funny and it's helpful. It's good. Uh, this book, Reset, uh, by David Murray, is just excellent. Uh, I think all of our pastors have either listened uh, to the audio book or read this book and found it incredibly helpful, insightful. Uh, highly recommend that one. And I think my favorite on the topic is an older book published in 1995. It went out of publication for a while and I uh, had loaned my copy out, my original copy out and it didn't get returned to me. And so I had to purchase while it was unpublished from a company called Wiffenstock. This book cost me $90. Like, <laughs> it's utterly, re and it's the ugliest cover ever uh, because it was unpublished. But I like the book that much that I'm like, I need a copy of, of it to, there's sections, I'll actually read a little section to wet your whistle to it. It's back in publication last I checked. You can get copies on Amazon if, uh, you know, for much cheaper than that. Who's the author? Leland Riken. yeah. Excellent, excellent resource. Uh, Redeeming the Time is the name of it. So, all right, I'll read from it in just a little bit. Let me start by saying uh, just the obvious. Pacing yourself in ministry is a very difficult task. It's a really difficult task. I was a distance runner, started uh, running long distance races in about second, third grade. Any distance runners out here? like three or four of you. All right. Well, I learned very early on in about second grade, uh, I was trying out for an AAU travel uh, cross country and, and track team. We had a, a one mile race uh, around a track. That's four laps around a 400 meter track. And I learned really early the value of pacing. Um, so I took, out, I took off like a rocket I was a good 50 meters in front of the next person in the first lap. Uh, so I took off, I did my first 400 really fast, about 60, 65, uh, those of you know pace. Uh, so I did my first, but, but then my second lap, guys started catching up to me. You know, I'm only, I was 50 meters ahead, now I'm only 25 meters ahead. And then the third lap, I started getting passed. And then in my fourth lap, I finished near last in the race. And it's a good picture of you can't, to, to run too slow, you never stand a chance of winning. To run too fast, you run the risk of, of burning out. Pacing yourself and pacing yourself in ministry is a tough skill. It's tough to get the balance just right. It takes a little bit of practice and a lot of intentionality to think through. Ministry life is really hard to balance because there's always demands on you. There's always more that you could be doing. It's never a finished task done, complete, uh, until it's actually done. There's always another visit you could make. There's always another phone call you, you could make. There's always a counseling need that could use just a little bit more attention. Uh, there's always another group to start, always another book to read, always another doctrine to study down, always another program in your church to adjust, 
Always another little crisis brewing that could use a little bit of your thought and your time and your attention. And then there's always that next sermon or that next lesson. So yesterday I taught one of the breakouts and right up until the breakout, I'm making adjustments to the breakout. I was listening to Tom's talk and there was a, a few things that I'm like, oh, I wanna say that in, in this breakout. They're never done until they're done. And then as soon as they're done, there's the next one. And you could always work more on whatever it is. I never am like, oh, it's, it's, it's ready to go. Never. Even giving it now, this particular talk, I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm sure there, there's things I wish I'd thought through a bit more, but it's the best I could do. And so here we are. And ministry is that way, right? There's always a bit more time that could be spent fine-tuning whatever it is you're leading in. Now, uh, the nature of pastoral ministry is such that there will always be more that you could do. You're never fully done, ever. And the things that you're doing are significant. They're important. Uh, they matter. As soon as you complete a task, there's the next one. Uh, the things that you're giving yourself to are, are weighty. There's always a lot of things on your shoulders. Nearly every season of body life that I've been in for 20 years at Emmanuel, there's a little crisis brewing. We celebrated a lot of, of God's kindnesses to us last night, but one of the things is, as Ryan was telling the story, I was just reminded there has never been a season of perfect peace at Emmanuel where there's not something significant needing attention. Matthew presented there's discipline cases in process going on at, at their church right now. Well, there are at Emmanuel as well, and some of those friends. I mean, people that I've spent hours and hours and hours and hours with. Um, those things weigh on you. So, all right, there's always a little crisis brewing. Always uh, marriage uh, on the verge of, of crisis, or the, at least it's hurting. There's always a wife struggling. Uh, and then you've got a, a, you know, a family that's leaving your church for one reason or another that you want to connect with and understand those reasons. There's, on top of all of those, there's the unresolved relational tension between you and one of your co-leaders from a meeting that happened last week that, man, I need to follow up with that, or boy, the way that was said or that decision was made doesn't sit well and it's kind of weighing on me. It's always threatening, becoming a little bit of a root of bitterness, springing up and defiling many. Then you've got your own family issues that need attention as well. Things going on with your children, things going on in your own marriage. Uh, then there's just brothers, sisters within your church that they just want normal level discipleship. Hey, can, can we grab coffee and talk through what the Lord is teaching me? It's, ne there's, it's never done. On top of this, teaching responsibilities that, that come up frequently. Uh, and I just said, teaching, preaching, it's, it's a task that's never fully done. There's leadership decisions and, and process of being made. I mean, just to give you a sample, at Emmanuel, there's a community group about to lose a community group leader. Another brother was in process of coming into leadership, has been through development. He had some falls and looked at things that he shouldn't have looked at. What do we do? <laughs> do we make him a leader? Do we wait for a season and leave the group without a leader for a season? Well, like, how do we sort through? There's all these kinds of things that spring up week by week, day by day, that you're interacting with and trying to give some leadership to. You add into all of that, all the work pressures and decisions that need to be made, and you add in a little bit of family tension, <laughs> personal family tension. You and your wife had a difficult conversation about a thing, or she was offended at, at something you said or didn't say or did or didn't do. You were just grumpy last night at bedtime with the kids. Um, and it, it, it begins to weigh on you. And then you add in a little bit of personal discouragement. You don't really like the way you taught yesterday. <laughs> Wasn't the best lesson, didn't come out as clearly as I thought. I, you know, I did the best I could, but it, was pre it fell pretty flat. 
It wasn't what I wished it was. Didn't finish that assignment. I've got an assignment due Tuesday that's been a months, months long assignment, months. And uh, I've got to fine tune it. Uh, it's, it's not quite ready for presentation. So as soon as I finish this, that's the next thing on the to-do list. And all of you have those kinds of realities, due dates coming of assignments that are due. You add in, uh, man, I'm not quite as confident that I'm as engaged with where my children are and the things they're going through. We have a 16 and 18 year old. They've got all kinds of issues, as you might expect. There's conversations that are more than five minute conversations needed. Where's that going to fit in? And they're in Cincinnati playing basketball today and I'm here and you're, you're missing things. You know, you can't be in two places at once. And that couple that you met with for counseling that you've been meeting with for six months, when you think about like, have they grown at all <laughs> for all the time given? Are things in any better place? Have I failed to help them in the way that, that I should? You can just see how fitting in pastoral ministry and balancing all of its demands and carrying the weight of it at any given point has the potential to crush you <laughs> under the weight of it all. All right. Um, don't be ignorant of this as well. Satan... Boy, he loves to come when you're discouraged. And he's not like, he, he's the opposite of one who has any compassion. He's not like, you know what? You've had a hard week. You've had a hard month. You've had a hard life. I'll lay off a little bit. <laughs> he sees you tired, discouraged, weak, a little failure. And he's coming like a lion, roaring, seeking to devour. What does a lion do? He looks after, where's the weak one in the flock? Where's the one with a little limp? Where's the one slightly injured? Where's the one slightly malnourished? Not the one in the safety and strength of the middle of the flock, running hard. Where's the one that's limping along a little bit? That's the one I want. If you've watched any National Geographic, they pick those outliers, you know, those, those weak ones. That's the one. And Satan, it's a perfect image of what he's like. And so you add in all the discouragement, all the pressure, all the difficulties, all the feeling like, man, maybe I failed. Maybe I didn't help like I should. And that assignment was pathetic, honestly. It just wasn't great. And now Satan, you add in satanic attack in the midst of all of it. And you start to see, man, your affection for the Lord starts to, to dwindle. What was warm, hopeful, uh, love for the Lord is now a little grumbling, a little complaining, a little discouragement, a little distance uh, from the Lord. Time in the Word quickly becomes scrolling on your phone. Friendships where there was once mutual accountability, there's just not time. Uh, they get crowded out with other demands. Your car that you like to keep clean hasn't been cleaned in months and months. Your grass that you like to keep mowed, it's about two, three weeks in and it's looking pretty rough. And you start to think, I bet the grass is greener on the other side over there in, in that situation. Some statistics. These were presented by uh, Darren Patrick, who's now committed suicide and, and dead. He was pastoring at Journey Church when he gave these and removed for a series of reasons. I'm unclear of all the details. They were presented by him and by Mark Driscoll about 15 years ago at a pastor's conference to help them to keep them from burning out. Here's their stats. 1,500 pastors leave the ministry each month due to moral failure, spiritual burnout, or contention in their churches. 50% of pastors' marriages end in divorce. 80% of pastors and 84% of their spouses feel unqualified and discouraged in their role as pastors. 50% of pastors are so discouraged that they would leave the ministry if they could, but they have no other way of making a living. 
80% of seminary and Bible school graduates who enter the ministry end up leaving the ministry within the first five years. 70% of pastors constantly fight depression. Almost 40% polled said they have an extramarital affair since beginning the, their ministry. 70% said the only time they spend studying the Word is when they're preparing for sermons or lessons that they're teaching. And then a few stats from pastors' wives. 80% of pastor spouses feel their spouse is overworked. 80% of uh, pastor spouses wish their spouse would choose another profession. The majority of pastors' wives surveyed said that the most destructive event that ever occurred in their marriage was the day that their family entered vocational ministry. Eight, uh, the majority of pastors' wives surveyed said that the most destructive event that occurred in their marriage was the day their family entered vocational ministry. Lest you think, yep, that's guys out there. That's not us. <laughs> in the last 12 years, I, I just sat in my office and counted the amount of guys who left with hopeful expectations and zeal and courage and a spring in their step. In the last 12 years, there's been 12 of our guys who are no longer in vocational ministry today. Some of those for great reasons. I'm not saying all of it is moral failure or personal failure, but for one reason or another, the Lord redirected and called them into different things and directed them into different things. Many of them struggled with burnout and discouragements, uh, overwhelming levels of discouragement. Multiple times every year, I'm on phone calls with guys who've left a manual with tremendous gifts, who've left a manual and are constantly thinking, I should quit. I wonder if I should quit. It's on the radar that, that maybe I should quit. Burnout, fatigue, endurance through great resistance, real disappointment, your own failures, temptations to fall, stress, pressure, difficulties, becoming disillusioned, being discouraged, uh, facing fatigue, having your heart break, you can see how it can all happen. Well, how do you avoid it happening to you? <laughs> how do you avoid it? I've been a pastor at Emmanuel for about 18 years. 15 of those have been on uh, staff, and there have been temptations and seasons in my own life where I've thought, maybe I should do something different. <laughs> Emmanuel's been wonderful but it's not been all easy street. In fact, there's been seasons where I really have considered, for me, originally, I think my, my original goal was, man, it would be so tempting to drive one of those brown UPS trucks and you get to you know, go with the doors down, driving a truck all day, you deliver packages, people are so happy to see you get their package they've been waiting for, you drop it, you put on whatever you wanna to listen to and you're in the car driving. Pastor Donnie has actually persuaded me to, I think, a better vision because he reminded me, yeah, but UPS, they don't get holidays off. In fact, holidays, you're double working. Not, and so I'm like, oh, I like to spend time with my family during the holidays. So he persuaded me for a new one. He's like, the uh, guys who drive the ferry between the parking lot and the Magic Kingdom, they're like up in a booth all by themselves, can listen to whatever they want. And people are so happy. They're going to the Magic Kingdom. Drive one of those ferry boats. Spot alligators in the water and do, you know, uh, anyway, so that sounds great. Some days I'm like, ferry boat driving for me. <laughs> All right. Let me, uh, let me give you several categories of things that the Lord has used to sustain me and keep me going through hard seasons. I hope the Lord will give to you. All right. Um, when you think of maintaining healthy balance between work and rest and those rhythms of, of work and rest, what is it that we should be striving for? It's helped me to think carefully and see biblically what God expects of us and to strive after God's prescription. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm, I'm honestly... I'm not going to fill out in, a great, in great detail the side of work hard. I said at the beginning, I want to I wanna persuade you, work hard, rest well. There's a lot of Bible that says when you're working, give it really good effort. 
Uh, don't, you know, when, when you're sitting at your desk or doing your work, I'm really scrolling Facebook or clearing a board on some stupid game or, you know, like when you're working, work. <laughs> when you're working, go after it. So a couple of, a couple of passages you know, Paul warned the church in Thessalonica, not even to, don't even eat with one who's unwilling to work. Don't even eat with such a one. Proverbs 6.10 and 24.33, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will pounce on you like a robber and want like an armed man. The Bible has a clear category of an expectation to work hard, I think there's an appropriateness. It can be over over realized uh, by by a lot of us. But but Piper's sort of wartime mentality, uh, David Platt's radical, uh, live radically, be all out with zeal. These things are are good and right and appropriate. I'm not going to fill out the side of work, though I do think it's important and actually bleeds over into your rest if you know and have some confidence. When I'm working, I am giving it my best effort. I am going all out. It might not be as good as somebody else can do. It's the best I can do, though. And I have confidence before the Lord I'm doing that. When you do that, it will help you to rest well. (laughs) It will really help you. And getting the balance right is important. But I do want to zoom in on the side of rest because it's way undervalued way under-prioritized, and because of that, way under-strategized and carefully thought through how we spend it. So I want to develop with you, if you have a Bible, you're going to need it here, and I I want you to think through the place of rest. So we're going to start in Genesis 1. We've spent a lot of time in a lot of the plenary sessions talking about Genesis 1 and 2, uh, God in creation. But I want us to take a look at a, a different thing that we haven't quite looked at as we've opened those passages. There's a lot to be gleaned in those passages. I want us to think about rest in those passages. Where do we see a model from God of resting from the creation account. What comes to your mind? Where do we see God resting? Seventh day for sure. Six days God works, but the seventh day God rests. He does no ordinary work. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't work that day. He takes, it, he takes it off. Anywhere else you see rest in the, those seven days of creation. Okay. Yeah, so after the work that God does any particular day, they're stepping back from the work, they're evaluating the work, they're saying, it's good. <laughs> Sometimes very, it's very good. <laughs> that sort of stepping back, evaluating, observing, it's, it's good. And then there's evening and there's, there's morning the next day. It's not, uh, hey, burn the candle at both ends. It's a 24-hour grind that is patterned uh, for us by God. There's rest built into every day, uh, I would argue. And then there's an entire day given to rest, to Sabbath. All right, so that's Genesis uh, 1 and 2, and God at rest. Pay attention, uh, Pastor Tom just mentioned it, uh, but pay attention to blessing and command. We often think the blessing of God comes that he gives us rest, but biblically in creation account, you're blessed with work and you are commanded to rest. (laughs) Blessed with work. He blessed them, Genesis, what is it, 1, 28. God blessed them, not and said, hey man, take a day off. He blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion. But rest comes to us in Scripture as a command. It is one of the Ten Commandments, to rest to take a day off. So he blesses us with work. He commands you rest. 
that in and of itself I find very helpful. And yeah. And if you if you keep an eye on I don't know, the radical generosity and kindness and mercy of God in these creation accounts, chapter 2 is overwhelming. It's just overwhelming how kind, merciful, and generous. He basically says, all right, you don't have a helper? I'll give you what you don't have. You don't have life? I'll breathe life into you. You don't have work? I'll give work to you. You don't have a place to live? I'll plant a garden. I'll, f I'll water it with four rivers. In that garden, I will plant for you every single a tree and plant and shrub that's useful for food, but not only for food, also that's what? It's beautiful to the sight. Can you think of trees? We're about to have spring around here that are beautiful to the sight. Why? Why does God plant trees that are beautiful to the sight? They don't have a functional purpose beyond ambiance. I would argue because God is incredibly kind. And when it comes to striking a balance and giving us an expectation around work and what God expects of us and rest, I want to convince you God is incredibly merciful. He's deeply kind. He's lavish. He blesses us with work and he commands us it's not a sin he commands you rest rest my little one it's like the command you must eat everything in the garden except the one that's prohibited but how much of the tree of life were they free to partake of and indulge in hey eat of that one sparingly you know it's a tree of life it's pretty precious you'll never die if you eat of it he doesn't put a prohibition against the tree of life. He puts a prohibition against the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? I would just argue because God is incredibly merciful. He's incredibly good. He's really lavish. He's very kind. He's very kind. He doesn't put on you an expectation beyond what you could ever do. He doesn't grind you up under you know the, the weight of work work yourself to the bone and then work a little bit more god is merciful he's really good he's really kind all right uh so let's let's see a little bit more of god at rest uh let's look at exodus 20 and just read the command now to rest this is in the Ten Commandments, and the one that gets the most description, the most words around it, Fifth Commandment to, uh, to, to rest, or the Fourth Commandment, whatever it is. Um, oh, I'm in Genesis. I'm like, this is not right. Exodus 20. All right, here we go. It's verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner that is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy." Now, personally, I'm not a strict Sabbatarian, but I do believe in a Sabbath principle that, generally speaking, one ought to work six days every week and take one entire day off every week, given to rest and refreshment. What's the aim of rest? What's the purpose of rest? What's to be the function of rest? And one way, we're commanded to do it because in so doing, we reflect God, who created everything, did this, and we're patterning our life after the example he set in his own work, his own creation. It's a, the purpose of it is to say, I'm going to work six days and rest a seventh day so that others would look at my life and know that God is real, know that God exists. I've patterned my life after what he's commanded and instructed. Another purpose of rest, though, is refreshment. 
that out of your rest would pop out a refreshed you. Out of your work, there's typically a product that you're given to producing. The tricky thing about rest is there's an absence of a product in one sense. It's not like my rest produced something. What it actually produces is a refreshed you, or what's it, what it's intended to produce is a refreshed you. Let me show you that. That is, I think it's Exodus 30. I didn't write down that, that reference. Uh, okay, no, it's 31. Um, Skip over to Exodus 31, and he's filling out the Sabbath command. Verse 12, the Lord said to Moses, You're to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all this, keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath because it's holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. <laughs> Life or death here, I mean, rest or die. <laughs> Whoever does any work on it, oh, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh is a Sabbath of solemn rest. Holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day shall be put to death. Therefore, the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generation as a covenant forever. It's a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested. And this is an interesting phrase, is it not? Picture God, <laughs> and he was refreshed. <laughs> That's fascinating. <laughs> God uh, rested, and in the rest he was refreshed through the rest that he gave, which gives us a great purpose for our own rest. It should produce a refreshed you. <laughs> Very generous and kind of God. All right. In addition to this weekly rhythm of work and rest balance where you got a full day off, it's helpful and insightful to look at the annual calendar that God prescribed for Israel to keep, particularly looking at the festivals and the holidays. We might call them statutory holidays where you get uh, an extended weekend here or there throughout the year. In addition to every single week, day off, reflect me and be refreshed every, once, once every week, every week. In addition to the evaluation of the work, declaring it good and resting, uh, it, it, you know, there's evening and there's morning. In addition to that, I would prescribe, consider taking some extended weekends about six, seven times at least per year, according to the Jewish calendar. Uh, so uh, to look at that, turn to Numbers 28. I love this. I'm going to read these pretty fast. Starting in verse 16. On the 14th day of the first month is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of this month is a feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Skip down to verse 25. And on the seventh day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work work. Verse 26, on the day of the first fruits, when you offer a grain offering of new grain to the Lord at your feast of weeks, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. Chapter 29, verse 1, on the first day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It's a day for you to blow the trumpets and you shall offer a burnt offering. Skip down to verse 7. On the 10th day of this seven, seventh month, seventh month's a good month, it's a good month. You get about three statutory holidays in one month here. On the 10th day of this seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation and afflict yourselves. You shall do no work, but you shall offer a burnt offering to the Lord. Verse 12. On the 15th day of the seventh month, this is the third one. Um, you shall have a holy convocation, you shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall keep a feast to the Lord 
for seven, seven days. Verse 35, on the eighth day you shall have a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work, but you shall offer a burnt offering. Verse 40, so Moses told the people of Israel everything just as the Lord had commanded Moses. That's a lot of statutory holidays, huh? <laughs> All right, in addition to this, in the Bible we do also get every 50 years is the year of Jubilee. You, your land, your livestock, everything rest. For how long? Whole year, man. Anybody ever taken a year off? I haven't. <laughs> uh, every 50 years, about once in your lifetime, maybe twice if you live to a nice ripe old age or if you time it and are born just right. You know, you get to do it when you're five years old and then 55 again. I don't know. Um, you, get, you get an entire year. Can you imagine? Off. Yeah. Oh, I've never had a year off. No. And, and, <laughs> yeah. I guess, uh, I suppose, maybe in my very young years, I, I would mean, yeah. All right. Whatever the case, I want you to see God is not stingy and he's not uh, a taskmaster who doesn't have a very good category of my people, my dear ones, my children, rest. I command you, rest. All right, what about Jesus and the model that he set when it comes to this rhythm of work and rest. Let's zoom in and, and see how Jesus did this. Of course, in one sense, Jesus had very busy and very demanding years uh, of public earthly ministry. Uh, there was, it seems, man, he's just going from town to town, and everywhere he goes, there's people flocking to him in need, and he's having tender compassion all over the place on them. And yet, even in the midst of busy, busy grind, he takes time to get away, and he advocates that his disciples do the same. All right, so let's see a couple of these. Mark 6. Uh, let's, uh, let's read verses 30 through 34. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him, all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going. They had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things. Grows late. Uh, so I, I say all this to say he did prescribe for them rest. But interestingly here, at least, Jesus holds that rest with a bit of a loose fist, doesn't he? Because he sees a crowd, 5,000, he's and he's like, man, they're sheep without a shepherd. There are people in a desolate place without food, and I have tender compassion on them, and I'll hold my rest. I desired to get away to a mountain and pray, to go to a desolate place away from the crowd, and yet, even in the desire to get away, there's a, a crowd, there's need, and there's sheep without a shepherd, and I have tender compassion on them. That's insightful in one sense. He had a plan to get away, which is good. It's not good to not plan ever to get away. He had a plan, and yet he held his plan with a loose fist and was willing to receive from his father uh, the reality of where he is and, and balance those things. But, uh, verse 45, and immediately he made his disciples after the feeding of the 5,000. Immediately made, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him uh, to the other side to Beth, Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up onto the mountain to pray. He did get away. <laughs> it's not that he made a plan, held it with a loose fist, didn't happen, and then it's never going to happen. He, he re-engaged in the plan to uh, get away and to pray. 
Jesus did. This is Jesus, the perfect one, all right? Uh, that's, that's very helpful. Um, Luke, uh, let's see, Luke 6 and verse 12. In these days, Jesus, he, he went up to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. Chapter 9, verse 28 of Luke's Gospel. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter, John, James, and he went up to, the mount he went up to a mountain to pray, and the transfiguration happens. Uh, Luke chapter 10, uh, you know the story, uh, verses 38 through 42 of Mary and Martha, where Jesus criticizes Martha for working without rest and commended Mary for having chosen the good portion. In other words, Mary chose to retire, to sit down at the feet of and to visit with Jesus and enjoy fellowship, which was commended, not condemned by Jesus. He tells us in Matthew eleven twenty eight, Come away with me, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you I'll give you rest. All right. So to me, seeing this emphasis of rest throughout the Bible is deeply liberating. It's deeply freeing. It isn't sinful to rest, quite the opposite. It's sinful not to rest. <laughs> Sinful not to rest. It's been commanded of you, rest. Jesus is very generous to say, rest, if you come to me and rest. It's like God <laughs> to take time to rest and to be refreshed and to enjoy the fruits of your labor. God himself demonstrated rest. Jesus in his earthly ministry demonstrated rest. Jesus commands us to rest. God commands us to rest. Jesus praised resting. He taught his disciples to rest. God blesses us with rest. He commands us with rest. Jesus promises that if we come to him, he will give us rest. And yet, how many of us, when we're really honest, find it really difficult to rest? The thing making it so difficult is that we feel guilty for not working. <laughs> There's things not getting done that could get done if I don't rest, I'll get this task done. And this task is important. And it is important. But rest is important. <laughs> rest and work are always competing for a resource that you can't give to both simultaneous. That resource is called time. <laughs> you cannot simultaneously, like we've We've spent 35 minutes in here. You'll never have those 35 minutes back. You have chosen and designated, that's how I'd spend those 35 minutes. They're now gone. For the rest of your life, gone. How much, what would be reasonable, what is God's expectation when you start calendaring out, here's how I'm going to spend my week. Here's how I'm going to tell my week what to do. How many hours of that ought you devote and designate to work? How many hours of that week ought you devote and designate to rest? We'll do a simple, really brass tack uh, exercise here. Every single one of us, not one of us is, is exempt from this. You get 24 hours every day, okay? Nobody gets less, nobody gets more. We all have the same amount given to us, 24 hours every day. You get seven days every week. That's 156 hours that you get every single week of your life. You don't get a second more and you don't get a second less, I guess unless you travel and switch time zones, but that doesn't count. All right. You still get, generally speaking, you get 24 hours, you get 156 hours every week. How many hours do you think you ought to give yourself to sleep every night? Take a stab. Come on. All right. Doctors say the average that a person requires to be refreshed and sort of their best, peak performance, if you will, eight hours. 
Can you cut the corners here and there? Uh, squeeze a little bit more work into a day and a little less sleep? Sure, but it'll catch up with you if you do it on a regular basis. And you're actually going to start underperforming in your work if you start cutting too much of that, that sleep. You're, you're made to require, God has created you in such a way that you actually require roughly eight hours. I'll give a little margin and say six on the short end to nine, ten on the long end and striking at, we should all strike somewhere around the doctor recommended, if you will, uh, peak performance of eight hours of sleep per night. Now, if you're cutting yourself short on a regular basis, consider whether or not you're overworking or just not allocating your time as appropriately and wisely as you can and should. All right, 156 hours every week minus eight hours per night of sleep leaves you with 112 hours that week. Okay, that's giving yourself eight hours of sleep every night. You still have 112 hours. Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. All right, I'm going to pull out the calculator. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Uh, 24 times 7 equals 168. What do you know? <laughs> All right. 8 hours times 7 is 56. So 168 minus 56. Whoa. 168 minus 56 is still... Uh, I got that next number correct. <laughs> Thank you. You get 112 hours. Yeah, that's right. All right, so we're at 112. Sorry for my math problem. I was not great at math, so yeah, thank you. Um, you get 112 hours. I would advocate for taking an entire day off. You have 16 of those. If you've slept eight of those, you still get 16 hours. So you take 16 hours, a, Sabbath, a full day off, per week, you are left with 96 hours, correct? 96 hours, that's, get, that's eight hours of sleep every night, and that's one entire day off plus that eight hours of sleep. You have 96 hours. How many of those 96 hours ought you to devote to working hard? You wanna hear what the national averages are? The average full-time working man uh, with his vocation, and it's a little bit hard to quantify here, but you broaden out and include commute time to and from, as well as work tasks that aren't rest tasks around the home. Things that need to get done, mowing of the grass, painting of the room, the average man, work broadly defined, not just his vocation, but broadly defined, he works 66 hours per week. The average stay-at-home mom, how many hours do you think she's working per week? 196. <laughs> All right. The average stay-at-home mom caring for... Uh, home tasks and caring for children is working 88 hours per week. 66, 88. So 66 hours, that man is left with 30 hours of leisure on top of his Sabbath. The average stay-at-home mom, not only does she rarely get a Sabbath, but she only has eight hours of potential leisure. Here's, here's a brass tack, men. Uh, the same principle uh, under financial sort of give until there's an equality. I would, I would say, brothers, free up your wife to enjoy some leisure. Uh, outdo in showing honor. Work 
uh, so that your wife can enjoy rest. That will actually refresh you in a strange way, uh, in a way where if you're just kicking your feet up and enjoying your own rest and leisure, uh, and she's grinding it out, uh, that won't. All right. I would encourage you go away and start documenting and keep track. Do it for a couple of weeks. Timestamp yourself. How many hours am I working? Work broadly defined. This is not a refreshing task. This is not leisure activity. This is work. How many hours are you doing? And here's where it gets a touch subjective. But what do you think God expects? I think, you know, you, you ought to structure your days to include a little bit of margin every day. Uh, when it comes down to an hourly allotment, I will say, God, I mean, God gives us the same amount of, of time each week. I do think you've got time to rest. Uh, you got 96 hours to play with. Tell them what to do. <laughs> Tell them what to do. Tell your work life what to do. <laughs> Don't just fall into it and mindlessly, you know, uh, plod through. You're going to squander and waste a lot of your work time if you do. And don't, don't do that with rest either. Tell it what to do. Uh, do. Do that assignment. See how many hours you're actually working, actually resting. And then from there... Here's what I really want to spend some time advocating for and encourage you towards. Upgrade your rest. Think carefully about your rest. Don't just fall into it and treat it as something that's, that's not worth thought and attention. Most of you don't work that way. You create to-do lists and get tasks done and prioritize. Prioritize how you spend your rest upgrade it, get everything out of it that you can get out of it. It's a precious thing. It's a gift of God. It's a command of God. Upgrade how you think of it and what you do with it. This is where I'm going to read uh, just a little bit of Reichen to you. What do you think the most pervasive use of free time is for Americans? Yeah. TV. Uh, so this is why I like this book so much. It gets brass tack practical. Uh, he basically, he's advocating for a culture that's given to overworking is a culture that the only time it has the mental capacity and energy to do once it comes time to rest is essentially plop down on, on the couch and veg out. I'm so spent, I'm so burnt out, I'm so tired. The thought of doing anything different exhausts me. All I have the mental capacity left to do is plop down on the couch. And then that kind of rest, those of you with children will know, if my children watch one movie, what do you think happens to their obedience level immediately following that movie? Okay, girls, it's time for bed. No movement. <laughs> now, if they watch two movies back to back, are they recharged, reinvigorated, ready to take the world for Jesus? Oh, my word. It, it, it was one of the least profitable uses of free time. And yet it's the most frequently used use of free time. All right. Hear Reichen on this. It's fascinating. Uh, this brings us to the subject of television. In 1980, this book was written in 1995, before you had smartphones in your, in your pocket, so I would argue his illustrations might be a touch different if written today. Um, some of your, your use is going to be, uh, your free time use is going to be scrolling more than television watching, but principle still applies. All right. 1983 study concluded that television accounts for nearly half of Americans' leisure time and 40% of the time not devoted to sleep, employment, and family and personal care. Uh, John Robinson's 1990 study uh, concluded that television consumes 50% of Americans' free time. Aside from the fact that television has replaced more worthwhile leisure activities, it deserves criticism for the passivity that it breeds. 
If we define leisure in terms of activity and opposite to it idleness or mere time killing, much television viewing cannot count as leisure. Psychologists have documented viewers' trance-like fixation that impairs the ability to engage in conscious thought. Studies of brainwave activity demonstrate the inactivity of the brain when focused on television. Withold Rizbinski believes that the case against television, not that it's passive, but that it offers so little opportunity for reflection and contemplation. It tells a story in a way that requires no imagination so that television watching should more properly be called television staring. The most significant critique of television is Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Postman shows that in contrast to written and oral discourse, television encourages passivity, incoherence, and ability to perform sustained thinking on a subject, lack of deliberation, and triviality. Television floods us with information without expecting us to do anything with it, and therefore it produces a sense of impotency. As a medium, television has produced a world of broken time and short attention span, and the internet has not helped. Television did not produce mindless and empty leisure all by itself. Television would never have proven so popular a pastime if it were not for the prevailing physical and mental fatigue that characterizes a society given to overwork. Most people lack the psychological energy to do anything other than plop down on front of a television and watch it. Furthermore, the American preference for recreation over culture, broadly defined, has undermined the intellectual and cultural content of leisure as much as television has. Still, the electronic media, including television, VCRs, music systems, influence people's values and leisure tastes as much as they are a product of them. Popular culture deserves to be understood and critiqued both positively and negatively from a Christian perspective, as several books have done. The point is not that media is, is all bad, but they've lured people into settling for less enriching leisure than they might otherwise be enjoying. You get the idea, right? What he's saying is the balance. We've not struck at the right balance between work and rest. Overwork means when we come to our rest, we end up spending it in ways that are not nearly as profitable and have an effect of refreshing us as we might otherwise do had we not come into it so exhausted, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally exhausted. The balance isn't right. And it's a complicated problem because then you spend your leisure in a way that doesn't produce a refreshed you, and then you get into work, and you're behind the eight ball in work, and you're not coming into it with the kind of energy, and then it's just a spiral that's a bit out of control. <laughs> so what do you do? Where do you go? How do you make headway? One, simply value what the Bible has to say about rest. Take it seriously and start telling your leisure better things to do. <laughs> uh, maybe we can brainstorm for just a minute. When you think of helpful, good, reinvigorating, actually refreshing uses of leisure time, has anybody ever spent leisure time that you're like, after I spent significant time resting in that way, I was actually refreshed by it. Help us out if you have. What do you do? How do you actually refresh through your leisure? What are some good examples? Anybody? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Different forms of recreation, outdoor activity. Yeah. So just as, as a family, when we play games together, okay. you know, like, like so when, when Ezzy watches a movie, yes, he's completely disobedient to him. But when we play a game together, he's obedient to him. When yeah. When we sit down as a family, it's okay. a simple game. Yeah. We're all refreshed, and there's a, a unity and a, and a service and a joy with one another that's not there when we just kind of squander the time. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Now, it does take a little bit more... It's a different use of rest than plopping down on, in front of a television as a family and sort of mentally vegging out. You're more engaged. It's, it's a more engaged form of leisure. Uh, but the effect of it on the back end 
in one sense it seems mentally maybe it's less restful because I'm having to do a little bit of work and thought and mentally engage in the activity, but the effect that it has, a refresh to you, if God rested in the Sabbath and was refreshed by it, you should ask yourself the question when thinking of how to upgrade it, what actually refreshes me? And tailor fit it to activity that actually has a refreshing effect. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. All right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's good. Go ahead. I'll add to that. I, good, I read all day. Okay. With a pen underlining. And I, well, I'm not going to take it anyway. And I'm not going to add anything to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've enjoyed for the past couple of years um, novels. Yeah. Yeah. But go ahead. Yeah. Singing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, right on. I love that. Yeah. I do want what I Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, Tommy. Okay. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah. Any other ideas? What's that? Fellowship. Fellowship. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Was there a hand in the back, Josh? Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah. Archer. Archer. Yeah. Yeah. Nice, nice. Who knew? Who knew? Yeah. <laughs> All right. You're getting some excellent categories to add to your repertoire of how you might tell your leisure what to do, tell your rest what to do. Now, it's not gonna, like we're not cookie cutters, we don't all refresh the same way. And so you're going to need to be thoughtful both towards you, towards your wife, if you have children, towards your children. What has an effect? How, how is my wife refreshed? And am, am I spending all of my time refreshing the way I like to be refreshed? Or to, do I give a generous amount of time to help her also to, to be refreshed? There's not a cookie cutter that all of us should spend all of our leisure exactly the same way. We've got different personalities. We have different vocations, different ways that we're coming into our rest, beat down by the week. I like mowing the grass as well. Um, most of my work life is tasks that uh, aren't quite as nice and tidied up and like checked off the list, but mowing grass, man, it's tall and then it's done and there's lines in it. And at least for today, it's, that's like, it would, it's done. Like, and I can see progress and that is helpful. There's endorphin release with a, an, an ability to finish something and look over it and say, all right, I like it. Like, <laughs> I can see that progress was made. Um, so, Washing your car, for me, that, that is not a work task. I enjoy keeping a clean car, and it's a, another of those, uh, there was, it was filthy, and now it's not filthy, and, and I can see that progress was made in that, and a lot of my work life and counseling stuff, 
we had a long conversation. There was tears, but I don't yet know. The proof is in the pudding, and that's going to take months to discover uh, how effective that time was. Time will tell. I don't know. Uh, so I like tasks that are a, a bit more tidy. They have a refreshing effect on me. I like sitting down under a tree with a book, and not an underlined kind of book, Luke, but a, a book that I get into a story and mentally think through. Just read this last year, C.S. Lewis's Till We Had Faces. It's fabulous. It's fabulous. It's a great picture. He had an unbelieving brother, uh, C.S. Lewis did, and he was a believer, of course. And, and it's a fictional account of an imaginary world. It's two sisters, and one of them is brought into an essential, like a world that's very real to her, but the other sister can't see what she thinks is make-believe. Make She's pretending, but, but it's, it's a picture of the spiritual life that uh, is so very real, and yet others are completely blinded to it. It's a, it, like the mental engagement, and I love fiction that way. It's so helpful. I uh, love imagination. Uh, those of you who've read the Wing Feather Saga, Man, there's so, like I just wept and wept in different sections of the Wing Feather Saga uh, by Andrew Peterson. Reading has a different effect. Now, it's a little bit more work up front than television watching, but the refreshing effect that it has. Reading out loud to my children in different seasons of their life. Going on a walk in a park with Christy is, again, it takes a different kind of energy to do it than television watching but the effect that it has, the next day after effect, the refreshment that it brings. Uh, playing a game in, in our family. Uh, I bought a boat a couple of years ago and being out on the water for a day for our family. For some of you, you're like, man, that's a lot of work to get out there and then, you know, it's, it's, it's an expense and it's just not worth it. it. It leaves you exhausted. Christy actually refreshes less through that than I do. So we don't spend all of our off days that way. Um, but we do spend some because I love being on the water and love praying out on the water. I personally, like I grew up in Florida, uh, Louisville's a bit landlocked to me. <laughs> but it's a way that I particularly refresh. What is it for you? What is it for you? Are you working hard without telling your rest what to do? If so, that's a recipe for a burnt out you and a fizzle out you. And it's going to have effect on the kind of work you're able to do uh, in time. This other category that I wanna give you, oh man, we're out of time, you're kidding. Uh, with your rest, I'm just going to give you the categories. Uh, value friendship when you think about your rest. I mean, like real friendship. If you're not spending some of your rest with friends laughing, enjoying meals and fellowship, and not just like intensive, like there will be some, even on your rest day, tearful sharing of burdens, listening to the struggle of a friend. But do that with a friend. Like, have friends. Spend some of your time with friends. If your family's not getting together with other families like ever that are friends, there's, there's probably a problem. Um, friendships are, are really wonderful. In prioritizing, I have to skip so much of this, but, but the, the priority of your family and not putting your family sort of as a lesser priority than ministry tasks. Uh, prioritize your family. It's one of the qualifications to be a pastor. If you can't manage your own household, how could you manage the household of God? It's a foundational requirement that your family be given appropriate time and attention and priority. Um, okay, I'm skipping too much, but... Um, I think the last category is re it's related to your relationship with the Lord. And Jesus was instructive towards us in that with his leisure and getting, like what seemed to be most refreshing, mountains. But mountains, not just for the sake of mountains, but prayer. Do you pray in your, your free time? Do you actually fellowship with your father? 
in that fellowship, is there time for you to evaluate, like, to repent and to receive grace from him? I tell you what, you come into your work week refreshed with a clean conscience, you'll start getting more work done uh, than if you come in to rest, dragging your feet and sluggish, distant from the Lord, misprioritizing in your family. And when you work really hard, in one sense, you ought to fall into rest. And now I'm going to use this rest and enjoy it to the glory of God. Strike at a good balance. Upgrade your rest. Give attention to how you spend it. Do the assignment of how many hours should I devote to this and upgrade all of it. With work, if you're squandering time at work, work harder. <laughs> work better. Work wiser. Make your to-do list and go hard after it. You're made for it. And then when it comes to rest, I mean rest deep. Rest well. You're commanded to enjoy this beautiful thing. Uh, let me pray for you. If you do have questions, I'm happy to stick around and, and talk through. Uh, brainstorm these things together as well. Spend time thinking about these things together and, and opening up. How do you spend your time? How does that go for you guys? Help me out. We're, we're struggling here. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven, we do pray uh, and thank you for categories you give us in your word. We thank you mostly that you're so generous. You're so kind. And you're so good. You draw lines in very pleasant places for us when it comes to work and rest and what you expect of us. You're not a taskmaster and you're not unreasonable. You're actually quite lavish, quite generous. You bless us with work and you command us to rest. And I pray that we would obey you and enjoy you as we strive after getting a proper balance between how much we work in life and how much we rest. And I pray that as we get the proper time allocations to those things that we would upgrade all of it and make the best use of the time because the days really are evil. And I pray that we would enjoy these things and strive after these things all for your glory. And we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys.